I would never have made it to that second part if I didn't have that first part. She always would talk to me about money, making sure that I looked after myself. Distractions and brain fog is so much more about work, dedication, and uh, time. Don't underestimate that. That's you, okay? I'm just going to share my little bit of advice here. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Internet Icons. We have another amazing guest today. And today's guest doesn't need much of an introduction. She is a quilting icon. She is Ms. Karen Brown from Just Get It Done Quilts. Hello, Karen, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So you're joining us from Canada. From Toronto, Canada. Yeah. On the East Coast. Awesome. Not the coast, but the East Side. <laughs> Lovely. How is it looking there? All spring and beautiful? Our weather has been flipping back and forth in typical Canadian fashion. You can wear a parka in the morning and a bikini in the afternoon and back and forth. It can't decide. But it's good for maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. All right. So we get to learn about quilting techniques and strategies from your tutorials and your Q&As and many other sources. <clears throat> but today we will deviate a little and uh, talk about what goes behind those beautiful, perfect scenes. So without much ado, first things first, how did you come up with that Beautiful name, Just Get It Done Quilts. I had to, I was going to a commercial event, a, a market that was only open to vendors. Uh, and to, I had to qualify. They just didn't let anybody in. I had to have a business card. I had to have a website. I had to have purchased so much from various vendors. Uh, so I needed to come up with a name. And I was fiddling around with ideas and one day I just came up with that. I really don't know what actually triggered it, but I can remember showing it to people and people go, oh, that, that's you. <laughs> that's you. Okay. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll keep it. Beautiful. Yeah. So what was Karen before Just Get It Done Quilts? Well, before Just Get It Done Quilts, my husband and I had a business that we ran for 38 years. Um, I'm also a mother to four children, so it was another full-time job, two full-time jobs at once. Okay. Ah, so what was that business? Was it also to do with quilting and textiles? Something totally different. It had to do with warranty uh, appliances, major appliances and warranty. Uh, we sold parts and we also had a couple of technicians on staff that repaired have you always been savvy when it comes to uh, creating these contents, your videos, your new newsletters? They all look so stunning and so professional. Looks like you have had a lot of experience in that area. Funny enough, I didn't. Um, I came to YouTube very naively. <laughs> I often say that if I had not backed myself into a corner by making a promise to a peer group that I really liked, um, that I would make this instructional video, I probably would have backed away because the first video involved such a learning curve um, and so many hours, like truly for three weeks, I did nothing but try to make this video. And there were things that went wrong. There were things that I got out of order and I had to totally refilm. I didn't have very good sound and I just didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but I persevered because I did not want to look bad in front of these peers. So um, I kept going. And the videos that I make now are not what those first videos were. They have a different format, a different way of storytelling. But I would never have made it to that second part if I didn't have that first part. How long ago was this? Six years. Six oh. years ago, March. This is my anniversary. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Generally, everything looks so glossy and beautiful on social media. Can you actually walk us through on how much work, dedication, and uh, time goes behind those beautiful videos or even your newsletters? Well, a video has a minimum of 20 hours, and I would say it's much closer to 30 or 40. Um, there's a whole planning in my head 
time um, that you can't quantify. And making a quilt, as you know, is not a fast task. It's a marathon. Um, so it's not often that I make a complete quilt per video. I've realized that that's just too onerous. Um, but between crafting, scripting, making, and editing, there's probably a good 40 hours involved. Gosh, that's for every video. That's for every video. Mm. Now, short, even the, like those short videos, those small things that you see on Instagram and uh, YouTube and TikTok, I think TikTok is what made them popular. There's probably at least three hours worth of work in one of those as well. So we're talking uh, a minute to two minutes long videos? Um, less than 60 seconds. Wow, you need to put in at least three hours. Mm, okay, so it's not as easy and fancy as it looks. There is a lot of raw material behind it. Yes, and you yeah. realize the experience that goes into it now too. Um, there's so many things where I look at it and go, oh, that's just too difficult to do. Too difficult to tell the story of, of how to do it. And there's many times when I will use graphics instead of actually demonstrating it because it's easier to show the critical things within graphics. Um, and just understanding, you know, there's camera angles, there's lighting, um, there's so many little things that you need to get to get the point across. Uh, yes, there's soundtrack and there's, you know, beautiful things in the background and colors and things like that. But if I don't get the point across, in the way that I'm telling it, why make like you lose the track of the video? So, how about uh, technology's role here? Uh, is it that someone has to be tech savvy or should have a lot of uh, softwares to help them create these contents? Or um, is it okay for somebody who can work with their laptop or these days the smartphones? Honestly, if you were just starting out, you don't need anything more than a smartphone. It mm -hmm. is, um, you can edit on an iPad or a phone. Um, I mean, you're not gonna be able to make a blockbuster on your phone uh, just because the scale that you're working at, you'll get frustrated. But just to make a, a, sh a YouTube short or a TikTok short, um, a phone is m more than you need. And I think the big thing that a lot of beginners don't understand is that their first video is not going to go viral. Their first video is going to suck, for lack of a better <laughs> word. And the good news is nobody's going to see it. Um, so you don't have to worry about whether you're going to embarrass yourself or whatever. The first videos are going to be hard. Um, they're not going to be as smooth and, and it's not going to have all the elements that you like in it. But you need to practice. And it takes a good year for you to figure out, one, what part of the story you want to tell week after week, and two, whether you even like doing it. Yeah. As you said, it takes a lot of efforts and time. So, yeah, people might think that, why should I even put in so much of efforts to make such a short video? <laughs> Definitely, it's their call. Many people think that I just get up and talk. Yeah, that's how it looks. It looks like I'm just thinking off the top of my head and all this beautiful prose comes out. No, it's been carefully scripted um, so that I can get all the points across in the minimum amount of words. Yeah, yeah, that is challenging. So how about, uh, how do you deal with brain fog? It's pretty common with the creatives. I, I really had a bad case of it last week. Um, but I actually turned to another YouTuber who was talking about focus. And I realized that I was not being kind to myself. I was playing a video game uh -huh. <laughs> and I was ranking <laughs> in a tournament so you could understand how many hours I was playing. And that was a distraction. Um, I think distractions and brain fog is so much more about avoiding something. You're going into something that you either don't feel good at or you don't want to do or it's going to bring up some feelings of inadequacy or or just imposter syndrome, right? And mm -hmm. 
sometimes you just got to buckle down and do it. Um, it's very hard being a YouTuber because, well, there's many reasons why it's difficult, but one of them is like all entrepreneurs, the buck stops with you. There's nobody standing at the door saying you have to have this video done by this week at this time. That's all self-imposed. And sometimes we have a lot of difficulty, you know, getting ourselves motivated. So um, sometimes the ideas just come flowing out and you wish you could bottle it. And then other times ideas are really challenging. And uh, how about consistency? Is it important for someone who is starting off or irrespective, they have to stay consistent and keep posting? How does uh, consistency actually play out? Well, there's two parts of it. It's the viewer that that likes to watch it and then there's the algorithm that you also worry about when i started there was this opinion that you needed to post every week all the time through uh 52 weeks of the year you got it or if you're a daily person you do it daily or whatever because the algorithm likes that the truth is the algorithm likes videos that people watch from beginning to end so if people watched your last video from beginning to end, it's going to, your next video is going to be put in, more, in front of more people because you make that kind of content. If you're the type of person that has a really good hook at the beginning, but you don't deliver on the back, people are going to be dropping off and the algorithm, no matter how frequently you uh, make videos, the algorithm's not going to favor you. So it's better to post a good video every on a on a cockeyed schedule uh, mm -hmm. than it is to post bad videos regularly well the algorithm is always going to put your videos in front of your audience if your audience always watches your video it doesn't matter what mm -hmm. day of the week it is they'll let you know that there's a new video out so the algorithm is very strong and really works for you if you deliver good content so when do you start getting sponsors like uh, you need to promote uh, products or services so the sponsors have come to me i don't actively go out and search for them which is kind of good very for me. nice um but i'm actually stepping back from the sponsorship right at the moment i find um i was finding it too stressful mm. i was um uh, and i get into the the I get into a mode of making a video for the sponsor instead of making a video that I want to make and maybe my my audience wants to to see. So I've stepped back from it a bit. I'm I'm still taking on sponsors but just not as many. Um, I've got some core companies that have sponsored me for 2 to 3 years and I I use their products. That's the bottom line that I have with all my sponsors is I must use and believe in their products. Uh, now you are committed to weave those messages between your videos and uh, your messages. Yes. Mm. All right. How important is it to build a support system around your business? Well, right now I'm very lucky. I live with my uh, husband and my youngest son and my youngest son makes dinner for us every single night. Mm. And my husband makes breakfast and uh, there's a couple of other things. And I have some support for housekeeping and I have some, um, I have a, the, a dog walker that can help me on the occasions when we're not able to walk. So it's really mm -hmm. important to have those things taken care of by other people so that I can. Yeah, I, yeah. focus on your work. Yeah, yeah. True. Um, when you're on a nine to five job, it's different. But here, it's it's on your own. You are the boss. Probably sometimes it's even easy to take a little detour. Well, also there's a zone that you get into, and you don't want to break it. Like if you're in the mm. zone, you want to keep working through it. Uh, and and it's been tough sometimes because sometimes that. Um, I've got to make a choice whether I'm having dinner with my family or I'm or I am uh, continuing with the video. I've recently made the choice that it's going to be the family, so I've got to be more productive earlier in the day. Um, but uh, I, I don't. There's YouTube and making a video has so many moving parts in it 
that my head is full all the time. If it's not just full of this video, it's full of the next five videos that I want to make as well. And there's not a lot of <laughs> space for thinking of other things. So I've uh, had to prioritize, okay, family first, then the videos, then these other things. Um, and uh, I do try to get out with my girlfriends a couple of times a month as well. And I usually meet up with friends to walk the dog. So it helps. Nice. Are your quilts available for purchase? No, um, mainly because people cannot pay you enough money for a quilt. I, I do have a couple of commissions that I work on for customers that come to me once every two years or whatever, who will pay the price that I will charge. Um, but I made the decision that if they're not, if people are not wanting to pay how much I feel it costs to make a quilt, how much I should be remunerated, I don't need to make quilts to sell. Yes, yes. And uh, why do you think it costs so much? Or why is it worth so much? The hours that go into it is um, so much more than you think it is. Um, but I think people won't pay for it because they feel it's, you know, a domestic art. It is something that people do for fun. So mm. why should I be paying for, for you to have fun? You know, you do, do this in your spare time. And in the past, it was made from fabric scraps. And, mm. you know, it was something their grandmother gave them. And they may have too many of them. So, you know, just like all the crocheted mitts, hats, and gloves, and things like people would have. Um, so it's just an understanding of how much work goes into it and how much talent needs to go into it as well. Yeah, quilting is a very skillful art. First of all, you need to have the right kind of material, the design, the pattern, then actual uh, execution of the uh, of the project. You need to cut it and it's like uh, a perfection. It's jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, it's a jigsaw, but th there is a place for people who aren't perfect. There is, that's the wonderful thing about quilting is just because it's not necessarily art gallery worthy doesn't mean that it's not worthy. I, uh, we make quilts to cover people with our love. Like it's just armor that they wrap themselves in. And we don't need to have to, that doesn't need to have a, a, a cost attached to it yeah priceless really priceless i mean it's very hard to put a price tag on uh, on a piece of art be it small or big it, it's hard because a lot of uh, passion and heart and warmth goes into creating it well i had a situation with a friend of mine whose sister-in-law passed away and they were clearing out her condo and suddenly they were in the bedroom and suddenly her husband just leaped across the room and pulled, like he had seen this corner underneath the bed and pulled out this old quilt. And it was a quilt that their grandmother had made wanting to have it. He had so many memories. Uh, mm -hmm. My friend said it was, you know, just a crazy collage of all sorts of misfit uh, pieces, but it was the prized possession for her husband to take away. How sweet. Yeah, I know a lot of quilts have uh, many stories it's not just pieces of fabrics put together nah mm -hmm. it's not just that all right uh, tell us a bit more were there any uh, women entrepreneurs in your family um my grandmother was uh she, after my grandfather died in world war ii so my grandmother was a mother to two small girls and she started a business she actually took over a business she she um bought a hair salon and she just was she just dived into hairdressing she didn't come into it with a lot of experience she learned on her feet but she kept learning she she would go off to classes and uh seminars and workshops to the point where she had three stores at one point uh three different mm -hmm. salons she was she always would talk to me about money and making sure that I looked after myself and making sure that I spent it well and saved it well. And though my father, I would say, was always the main breadwinner in my, between my parents, my mother also was amazing. She 
when all four of us were young, she ran a day camp um, out of our home. We had a little bit of acreage when we, at the time, and this is when daycare was not even common. So it was a day camp, and we had kids come from all over to learn stuff. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. She did a really good job. I have amazing memories of being a kid going to this this day camp and many other people. I, I just presumed everybody else had that same type of uh, upbringing. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized we were special. And she yes. ran, uh, and then later she ran a daycare out of our home and um, she's now a professional storyteller. Mm, nice. How do you face challenges as a woman entrepreneur? Not only now, even back then when you and your husband were running a business, as you mentioned earlier, how, how difficult was it? And how did you actually face challenges? I never felt that I couldn't do it because I was a woman. Um, just because of the legacy of my mother and my grandmother before me. But I did honestly carry more of the burden of care for our children than my husband did all through our business. Um, you know, I was the person that took them to, to, uh, sports events. I was the person that took them to, uh, doctor's appointments and handled all the teacher interviews and who was doing what and who needed what. Um, it's not to say that my husband did nothing. He was, um, busy, but I carried that burden with me. So Probably. you're constantly, I can remember when I had my third child after that and things were just chaos you know trying to do everything and i realized i had to make a choice whether i was going to be a mother who worked or a working mother and at that point i did put my family first that says a lot yeah as women i guess nesting comes naturally for us without with or without our knowledge we incline towards that we want to do a good job at it <laughs> We want to be good mothers, right? We just don't want to, we don't, there's a saying of half asset. That's a kind of crude, but uh, we don't want to do it halfway. We, mm. we want to, we want to be good mothers too. So. Yes. Fascinating. And you nailed it. All right. What does financial freedom mean to you? Financial freedom means that I get to do what I want to do. And that's the wonderful right. thing. Um, the wonderful thing about YouTube is if you can, um, if you have something that you're passionate about, there's people that are looking for that and there's an overlap of what they want to learn and what you want to tell them. And if you can just find that niche and that culture, you don't need to worry about having a million um, subscribers. You just mm. have to have a very loyal community. All right. Do you think uh, YouTube or social media overall is crowded these days? Well, it's crowded with some people wanting to do the same thing over and over again. Mm. One of my very first discoveries, like I discovered in the first five minutes of me making a video, was that I was not Jenny Doan. I could not make a movie like the uh, a video like Missouri Star. Um, I just didn't have the same presence as her. I didn't have the same outward energy that she has that's so welcoming and just makes you feel like you're... You know, you're. <laughs> let's go learn from our good friend Jenny, and <laughs> I had a different energy, and I had to find the way I wanted to teach. And luckily, there's a lot of people that want to learn that way. Right, you're so right. We shouldn't lose our individuality. Yeah, there are so many people doing the kind of work oh, we do, but yeah, that's how you stand out. You do you. And YouTube, we have access not just to our city, people in our city that want to do the thing that we want to do. We have access to people around the world. And don't underestimate that. You know, there's many people. I met a young woman who had just moved here from Nigeria. And her audience is all back in Nigeria. But she's telling them about what life in Toronto is like. And uh, there was... There's a gentleman in Toronto that reviews Tamil movies. Like there's a whole theater subculture and he does that. Um, and he's not even Tamil. He's 
I think he's from Montreal, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, so it's just interesting how you can find your group of people. I met a young woman who liked to dress up the same way as her dog. So she w she had a whole fashion channel for people that like to dress their dog the same way they do. And, you know, at first you might be very dismissive of it, but for what was her passion and her attachment and whatever, she found people that bra their brains and their needs were the same. And within that culture, they didn't need to feel any shame or awkwardness or they didn't belong. That's where they belong. So that's what people have to look for. Very different. Yeah. Right. Uh, how important is social media, especially after the lockdown? I I feel people are opening up and, uh, you know, visible on social media. I think tic the TikTok and the short platform has changed the way people consume entertainment. Um, people are very triggered by the sounds that are common in the short form videos, like there's textures and things that people will watch for 60 seconds and then they'll move on to the next thing. Um, I don't know how many dance videos you've watched of people doing exactly the same darn thing. Like just recently with Beyonce and Texas Hold'em, you know, like you're scrolling through and you're seeing the same, <laughs> same people doing the same thing with the same song. But you can do that for 40, 47 seconds if you like the music and then watch the next thing, the dog rescue or the, uh, the cake being crushed or whatever, whatever. Uh, the algorithm mm -hmm. decides you want. Um, I think it's bad for TV, you know, in the broadcasting world. It probably has an impact on movies as well. But for long form video, there's still people that are searching for that. How do I do this? How do I do that? That's actually the most search for, for term on YouTube is how do I? And you need, there's still a place for videos that answer that question. Mm. It is a tough place, both consumer-wise and uh, provider-wise. It is, uh, a lot is expected and also there is a lot of competition. Well, I also find a lot of traditional businesses do not know how to use the influencer world. You know, they, where you used to buy a yellow page ad, um, you used to, you know, put things on postcards and go to trade shows. With YouTube and other social media, there's a whole different way to access the public. And it's absolutely crazy how an influencer can just show themselves, oh, look at this pen I'm using. It's so good. And they can sell out in those pens if it's, if it's the right item being shown the right way. It, they can yeah. sell out in that in 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 a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. So it, there's a whole different way to use the influencer world. I have talked with a number of people in my own industry and told them how it works. How do you how do you find someone? How do you sponsor them? What is the expectation? Um, and it's different for every platform too. It's different for Instagram as it is for YouTube as it is for TikTok. Okay. Uh, how do you deal with comments, be it positive or negative? I have been very, very lucky in that 99.9% .9 of my community are generous and kind. There's occasionally times when I get a negative comment about, I'm not going to say negative, like there's different degrees of negativity, right? There's, there's the people that say, I prefer to do it this way. And that's great. That's absolutely great. They have found their way of doing things and they're confident in it and they're just sharing that there's another way of doing it. Then there's the people that attack you, attack you personally, like don't like all the ads or, you know, you should be making enough money that you don't need to do this or something like that. Um, yeah. And I find if I react emotionally to something, if I feel it's a personal attack, I'll just delete it. They'll mm. just remove it from the space. Or if I find they attack someone else, um, so often they oh, say, well, yeah. that's bloody obvious. Like, why would anybody ever have to make their own pattern or, or buy a pattern? Everybody can make their own. And that's just not true. Different brains work different ways. And there's no way that you can say that this other person is wrong because they're doing it that way. Um, 
if it works for them, that's fine. And I'll delete those comments as well. I won't allow any per any attacks on anyone else. So it only happens occasionally. I would say maybe, maybe not even once a month. Uh, because YouTube also has their own filter system, so they they um, oh, yeah. automatically delete anything that has a sw has swearing in it. They automatically delete hate speech. Abusive. Yeah, every so often there's some porn that slips in as spam, but if <laughs> people can uh, delete those, if it gets reported twice, it mm. disappears. Yeah. So um, I'm actually very very lucky. I know that there's a lot of younger people out there. Um, that get personally attacked, they get their body shaped attacked, mm -hmm. um, they get their race and uh, uh, maybe even religion attacked. And mm -hmm. that's a hard space to be in. That's a lot of negativity. And if you're possibly in that space, it would be good for you to have another person to filter those comments for you. Just have somebody else go through and delete all the ones that you don't want and then you read a curated list of comments yeah that makes sense um it doesn't affect you personally and you could continue doing your creative work mm. it's because that's that the comments are really the only feedback that you get as a as a youtuber like it goes out there into the um universe space and how do you know whether you've done a good job or not like you, you do need to read the comments so that you've done something good. Or if you haven't clarified a certain point, maybe you can do a second video to clarify that point for people or just do a, a newsletter or something, something that can clarify or do more of what the people are asking you for. Um, I often will make a quilt top if people want to know how to, how to quilt it. So I'll do another video on how, how the quilt is actually completed. So that's the comments are important. It's not something that you can disappear from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you have your um, tutorials, your Karen's Quilt Circle, your newsletters. You are also a part of your local Quilt Guild. Yes. Quilt. Right. I'm pretty sure you two have only 24 hours like everybody else. How do you manage your time with so many activities revolving around you? Well, I'll be honest, when I worked full time, I could not make a video a week. It was just not possible. I probably made a video every other week. Um, and I have grown children, so my children don't need me anymore. Uh, one of the reasons why I started the YouTube channel was to fill my days because my children had gone off and they're young adults doing what young adults do. So it's it's, this is now my full-time job. This is now my job, but it's also my hobby. So there's a very fuzzy line there between what I'm doing for me and what I'm doing for my channel. And just for my own mental health, I have tried to align my channel with what I'm doing. It's rare that I make something just for the channel. It's always a quilt that something about the quilt or the quilt project that I'm working on currently. What's your advice for those who want to start an online business? Uh, not necessarily a YouTube channel, uh, generally an online business. My first, my first advice is just accept that you're going to suck for the first year. The first year will be hard. It is a long game because you have to find your audience and your audience needs to find you. And what you think you do well may be something else. Like I know many people that um, started into, there's a, a young woman that I follow, her name is Amanda Rach Lee, and she was doing DIY and all sorts of things. And then she started showing off her calendar that she makes for herself. Um, and she was artistic, so she had some nice, uh, beautiful script that she was doing. And she morphed into a bullet journal channel with, two million or more subscribers and now she makes which in the beginning she was selling stickers now she actually sells planners and now she actually sells ones that you color in she does all the work and you just color them in so she's evolved as she's discovered what people that follow her want and what she wants to do too i mean she's been growing up as she's been doing this um 
And the same with other people, even myself. Um, this year, I'm going to move into classes um, because people are looking for that one-on-one. -on -one. They they want more access to me, so I'll offer up a class where we're doing something and they can show up and ask their questions and go from there. How exciting. This is really nice. So is it going to be online classes or do you also encourage uh, in-person? I'm going to start off with in-person in classes first. Not not in-person, in-person. They're going to be Zoom, but I will be there. Uh, okay, one-on-one. -on one-on-one -on -one with them um, or one-on 20 or 30, how many ever is in the class. Um, mm -hmm. The materials will be available online for them to access after the class, but there will be an exchange of uh, tips and advice, whatever they need for that class. Mm -hmm. Sounds really exciting. All the best. Uh, so is there anything else you would like to share or add, Karen? Um, I'm just going to share my little bit of advice here with YouTube. So many people are afraid to get started. They're mm -hmm. afraid. They're afraid that they're going to look bad. They're going to afraid that they're not doing it right. And those fears are totally valid. You probably won't do them right. And you probably, the first videos won't be good. But if you persevere, if you, if you put in the time, you will find what you enjoy doing and the freedom to do, to make money doing something that you enjoy doing is worth pursuing. Yes. Thank you so much for this valuable tip. I'm sure many, many of us will uh, value this. Yeah, it is common to feel awkward or uncomfortable initially, but then, yes. And be happy with being in front of a small audience, but the, the audience, as I said before, enjoys doing what you enjoy doing. So don't think that your, your video is going to go viral. Going viral is actually quite frustrating if let's say you <laughs> made a video and it went viral you would make no money on that there's no way to monetize your first video going going viral um, and viral the technical meaning of viral is if it's being seen by twice as many people that's in your subscribe like your sus subscriber list so I have just shy of 400,000 at the moment so a video for me to go viral would have to have over 800,000 views. Yeah, of course, the math. Yeah, that is beautiful, Karen. Uh, I have a fast five questions for you. You could give me either a word or a sentence long answer. Okay. All right. What's your favorite free time activity? Quilting. <laughs> Quilting for yourself. Quilting for myself, yes. <laughs> right. What are you still working on as an entrepreneur? I am still working on balance, balance and focus, trying to, when I have to do something, just sitting down and getting it done, not waiting for the adrenaline to click in. What would you be if you were not what you are today? Oh, if I had to, if I could start at the beginning and choose a, a um, profession, I would probably end up being either a film editor or a forensic accountant. I love puzzles and both of those lead to my strengths. Awesome. What is the biggest strength of your business? I think my biggest strength is that people see themselves in me. I'm not trying to be anybody that I'm not. And one word that describes you. <laughs> are there are oh, too many words. There's too many words, but. Uh, some days it's just erratic. <laughs> I honestly think that I've, if I was back in school, I would be um, probably diagnosed to be on the spectrum somewhere because I go from that frazzled energy to very directed, very concentrated energy all the time. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karen, for doing this. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed talking to you. I'm sure your thoughts and inputs are really really valued thanks so much wish you all the best thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure thank you